could make it tonight. <laughs> All as excited as you can be to hear from Lynn Hill. I'm one of the co-coordinators for the Leadership Speaker Series, along with my fellow senior, Leah Hume. Um, the series is here to add to your toolbox of leadership skills. There is no one way to be a leader, and um, the series is not intended to be prescriptive. Uh, it's here to prompt reflection and thought regarding your leadership style. I know the Gunnison Valley is full of amazing leaders because I gratefully get to interact with a bunch of them each and every day. So whether you're a student here at Western or a professor, a coffee barista, mom, dad, everything in between, um, we all have our different strengths and leadership is about unlocking the potential within each of us. Uh, as a, a recreation outdoor education major, uh, <laughs> I'm, continually, <laughs> I'm continually striving to be uh, a better leader in my daily life and not only because it'll naturally lead to more opportunities for me, but um, in today's global world, it, we need to have more intuitive thinking and innovative thinking and synergy going on to promote and push our ideas forward. Uh, the best way to do that is to utilize our strengths in leadership. Um, I hope this semester's leadership series has brought you as much joy as it's brought me. I hope it's given you a little insight to your potential contributions to this world and has allowed you to dream about the impact you may make in your lifetime. Um, with that being said, I'd like to give a few shout outs to our sponsors for helping us be able to put these on and have such amazing speakers like Lynn Hill, Lynn Hill be here tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank the School of Business, Center for Environment and Sustainability, the Recreation and Outdoor Education Program, the Exercise Sport and Sports Science Department, uh, Wilderness Pursuits, Irwin Guides, and the Convocation Fund Me. Uh, legendary inspiring speakers here in our valley, uh, please look into our membership and partnership uh, options and there'll be forms on the table outside of the auditorium after the talk. Um, Luke and Lynn, Luke Mihal and Lynn will have their books and Luke will have his signs out there as well. Uh, check out our archives, like our Facebook page or join our listserv uh, to figure out who our future speakers will be. We're hoping to have at least one more at the end of April, um, Aaron Kenny, who started the Innovative Forest Kindergarten School. One last note, there will be a bouldering session tomorrow morning in the Mountaineer Fieldhouse at 9 a.m. with Lynn Hill. I hope you guys can all join. And I'd like to hand it over to the notorious Mark Gibson. Thanks, We've got a special treat for you tonight, for the first time ever, live here in the Taylor Hall Auditorium. I give you the dirt bags.
Good afternoon, everyone. We uh, are dirt bags. Maybe not so much anymore, but right now I don't feel like one. Uh, first, I want to shout out to Lynn Hill. Uh, I don't know if you remember. I know we all have a lot of us have Lynn Hill stories, but back in '97, I was at the International Commerce Festival and I had an opportunity to belay her. Kind of <laughs> uh, short rope trying this 12D that was super reachy. And she's having a tough time. They kept short roping her. She'd go, blam. She's like, this is so slack. And I thought I was doing a good job, but sorry about that. <laughs> Much better now. Anyway, uh, here to talk about Luke Mihal. And uh, Luke Mihal is one of my best buddies. And uh, he just wrote this book, The Great American Dirtbags. And Luke is so inspirational for me as a climber, as a person. Um, Luke is, I would say, one great word is uh, dramatic, is a great word for Luke, Mihal. Um, and you combine that with the passion for life and climbing, and I just love hanging around with, around Luke, so it's fun. <laughs> it's a privilege to be up here introducing Luke and then getting to hear Lynn speak. Um, I first saw Luke Mihal sitting at Hartman Rocks, on one of the rocks, right above the base area, back when I was younger. And I was saw this rickety car coming down the road, and I was like, what is that car? Spray painted? Who is that? But secretly inside, I was thinking like, man, who is that free man riding down that road? And who knows that one day Luke would inspire me to embrace the dirtbag lifestyle too, so thank you to Luke. Thanks, Al Smith. So apparently I've lost my voice right before my speaking, uh, but I'm gonna be quick about this. But I wrote something and then I forgot what I wrote, so I'm gonna uh, get it here. You guys can probably tell I went to Western. <laughs> so you're probably asking yourselves at this point, <laughs> why am I even up here speaking? Uh, what credentials do I have? None, really. Uh, I do have this piece of paper I brought. It says uh, Western State College. I don't think that means anything. I don't think that means anything anymore. Bachelor's of Art and Recreation. So now you know that I don't have any more credentials than any of you. Anybody else wants to say something, they can come up. Um, so really talking about, uh, this, is where, this is where I met Luke Mihal, as we're introducing him. This is where I met these guys too, and a whole bunch of these jokesters back here. All these guys that have become, and ladies that have become my very close friends over the years. Um, my greatest memory of Luke, because I had just gotten a job at Palisades. Um, probably one of the greatest restaurants, got us an ass to offer. Uh, I was washing dishes in the back, and uh, the only way I could describe Luke at this time was a hippie. Comes back in the dish pit, it's like, hey man, I heard you're on the rescue team. You want to teach me some stuff about rescue team so I can get on it, and then I'll teach you how to rock climb. And that's really what brought me to rock climbing. So he took me out to Hartman Rocks with another buddy, Jared, and uh, he was a self-taught trad leader. That was pretty obvious, pretty quick. And, uh, but we made it to the top of something, I don't know what it was, and we've been climbing ever since, um, still to this day. Um, so I, I really got to uh, thank Luke for that. So the whole point of this thing is leadership, right? How do we learn? What is leadership, you might ask? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know what leadership is, and I've been paid professional leader for the last 14 years. Uh, so yes, all of you wondering, you can make a living with a degree that says recreation, just so that you all know that. And the best part about Luke is Luke also got a recreation degree, and then as soon as he got it, he promptly crumpled it up and threw it in the trash as he decided that he wanted to be a writer um, and take that very seriously. He's been on a long road to, uh, on his writing career. Um, with a lot of support uh, from Al and all of our friends here. Um, and I just, that to me is what leadership is. Someone who's not afraid to grab the bull by the horns and follow your dreams and do what you want to do. That 
is what leadership is to me. So ladies and gentlemen, here to introduce the wonderful Lynn Hill is the wonderful Luke Mihal. <laughs> Somebody used them. We were... <laughs> and uh, this seems pretty. This seems pretty good here. Uh, I found this dead rose in the trash, and I'm now going to give it to you. Thanks for the dead rose, Timmy. So I am incredibly psyched to be here tonight. Usually there's some sort of like warm up or something that needs to happen, but that is clearly already happened. You guys are warmed up, huh? All right, so I'm incredibly psyched to be here tonight. I went to Western and uh, I graduated 11 years ago, which uh, basically seems impossible, and I know to my professors um, that probably seems impossible too, but time really flies, and uh, you know, college is a, is a great situation, and I think what I really remember most from Western is that it transformed me into who I am today. And it really, you, you know, some people come into college knowing who they are, some people spend their whole lives knowing who they are. I was not one of those people, and I really found out who I was at Western, and I found my life's work at Western, and that was writing. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm just gonna get right into it. I know that uh, Lynn is, is gonna say, she's a great speaker, she's a great climber, and she's gonna have some really intelligent, articulate things to say, and I don't need to be up on this microphone here rambling, so, with my writing, I, I really have been trying to be creative through and through and to not try to stay stagnant in doing the same thing over and over. So I'm working on some new creative things this year and I've been holed up in my, in my home office all winter and I've been writing some things and I just wanted to read a couple of those things tonight if you guys don't mind. So... When I was here at Western, my, my path as a writer was very, very slow, and I really didn't decide exactly what I wanted to do for my career until about two or three years ago when I actually moved away from Gunnison. Um, I decided I wanted to be a writer, and I wanted to create my own writing. You know, I'd worked for newspapers, and I'd worked in PR, and different things like that. So if you guys are on your path of finding out where your life's work is, um, sometimes it takes some time. And, you know, I'm, I'm almost 37 years old, and I'm just now, like, hitting my stride of, with what I want to do, so. And I'm a dirtbag, so dirtbags, we get a little more time. And, uh, and, and, and I know what Timmy was saying about my recreation degree. Every time I am out climbing, because I write about climbing a lot, I'm like, you know, I'm working right now. So I don't get paid a lot of money, but if you can find something that this is work, but this is exactly what I would be doing for pleasure. If you can somehow find that, um, that's, that's an incredible thing. So I'm working on this poem right now for a short film that I'm doing, and this is a brief glimpse into that. It's called Last Thoughts on the Dirt Bag. You know, for me, it all began looking, looking for something real in this world, something real. Something I could not find in the mall, I could not find in the bar, I could not find in a car, I could not find trapped in walls. So I started searching, started searching. At the time, keep it real was the phrase. The 90s, those were the days. But I was depressed and dreaming of the 60s like something was missing. I wanted Kerouac, I wanted to bring him back. And something was missing. And Kerouac was long dead, and so were the Grateful Dead. But it wasn't time related, because everything is related, and the only time is right now. In the midst of all the dope, I picked up a rope. I picked up some hope. Little did I know 
the rope was dangerous, and hope was dangerous, but it's good to be dope, and to live a life is dangerous. We were just two dope boys in a Cadillac. Rather that, we were two dope boys in a Subaru hatchback. Way before hashtags. It was good to be a dirtbag. It was good to see sea to shining sea. It was good to see America. It was good to see there's still some heroes left. Because all the heroes went left. Because, you know, it all started after I left my past behind so I could rewrite my future. Write something inspired by the sky, the rocks, like, you know, forgetting about grades and clocks and finding men and women who climb rocks. I was in a dirtbag state of mind, not an empire state of mind. You know, because I learned I could dig poetry, I could dig rapping, I could dig scrapping, I could dig jamming, hands, fingers, and feet, whatever it took to make ends meet. Every day begun with the sun and retired with the fire, looking for hope every, every bend, hoping each and every day would never end, never ending feeling of climbing so zen, so zen we had to do it again and again. It took us everywhere, but it always took us back to the desert. Ed Abbey was gone, but in our hearts, desert solitaire was like dessert for the soul. The Colorado Plateau, like rock and roll, like hip hop, we wouldn't stop. We soon found we were carriers of a torch. Those are too mad to beat, to be sad. I mean, like living in poetry, living this life was meant to be, because it is. So that's a work in progress. But it's all good. So I'm, I'm working on my third book right now. I've got a couple books. We're going to be um, selling them afterwards, and Lynn's going to be selling her books as well. Um, and it, for me, as a writer, it took a long time to figure out to be a writer, you have to write a lot. Um, you could like publish one article and tell people you're a writer, but if you don't write a lot, you're, you're kind of full of shit. So this, this chapter is just a work in progress. It's a rough draft of the book I'm working on right now, which is a, a full-length uh, novel-type book. And so it's, it doesn't really have a name, it's just chapter 21, and I just gave it the title of Water, Food, and a Woman. But the, start, the story does not involve water, food, or a woman. And it's about the Black Canyon, which I figured would be uh, appropriate here. So my path as a climber had to face a most real enemy, pure, unadulterated fear. This fear manifested itself in the biggest, baddest canyon, the nearby, intimidating chasm in Colorado, and even the United States, the Black Canyon. The black, as we called it, was basically in our backyard. Had it been further away, I would have never faced it, never seen the terror or transcendence it has to offer. Since it was closed, only an hour and a half away, there was no other option to face if you really wanted to call yourself a climber. Am I right? My buddy Gene, 514 Gene, had the energy of 10 climbers. One day when I proposed, we did a big climb in the black called the cruise. He was on board with no hesitation. Let me, I, I forgot to do a little preface with this here. So this particular climb, I was, I was actually really inspired um, by Lynn and her, uh, her climb of the nose and just her entire climbing career. But I was reading her book, um, Climbing Free, and she had, uh, talked about her different climbing experiences, and I was really amped up to try something big. And uh, I basically, you'll, you'll see what happens, but uh, um, yeah. it's, it's good to bite off more you can chew sometimes. The black was already in my heart and soul, and it terrified me as much as it inspired me. There was a deep focus you could attain after toiling on the wall all day, and it was that focus, coupled with the chemical that properly facing pre-releases, that kept me coming back. So Gene and I woke up, ate oatmeal, slammed coffee, pooped, and shouldered the ropes and gear as we slipped into a gully of poison ivy and fear. The sun came up and we found the base of the route, the cruise. 
We were already fatigued and tired, and had we known the angle of repose that an experienced climber has, we would have suggested something else, something smaller, something easier. That said, a climber can only gain experiences through experiences. Everything else is just bullshit. Talk, and the world has enough of that. We looked at each other with the eyes of eternity before we started up. Gene led the first part, a wandering fractured slab that leads to the base of a giant wide crack. As I belayed and looked up at the wall, in front of us seemed infinite. The top was so far away, I couldn't conceptualize an end in sight. And these are the greatest climbs, when one is fully engaged with the experience, having no idea how it will turn out. The off-width, wide crack, was my lead. I wanted it, but only in the concept of an idea. The actual climbing of the crack was part horror, part beauty. The crack, wide enough to get my elbows and knees in, made me work for it. The Gunnison River slowly roared below, and soon my voice would be muffled. We could only communicate in the brotherhood of rope. When I would pull up the rope to Gene, he would know exactly what I was doing. When I ran out of rope and pulled it tight to Gene, he would have to start climbing. Two figure eights knotted together, two knots of eternity on each end of a rope length. Jamming my elbows and knees in in fear, a simple math equation, a puzzle that demanded athleticism and the management of the mind. I was also climbing like an amateur. Even though I had a couple Black Canyon climbs under my belt, I still fumbled and made movements like a scared beginner. I wore a small pack filled with a hydration bladder and snacks to the climb. Pears and lemon bars that my girlfriend had made. Not good snacks. Especially when you're climbing in an off -way. As I was 100 feet from Gene, my body slammed in the crack. I felt a sensation of water dripping down my back. The hydration bladder had leaked, and it dripped all the way down to my feet. I tried to move upwards, and my shoes were covered in water. I didn't have a piece of gear in for the last 20 feet, and I panicked. My heart beat faster than it ever had in my entire life. Relax. Breathe. These are rarely followed but useful mantras in everyday life. In climbing, a simple mantra can keep you alive. The fear is always greater than everything else. Just tell yourself. Just breathe. You can get through this. I finally pulled up to the belay ledge and it felt like I was going to puke. It took me hours to climb that pitch. I was humbled, hungry, hobbled, a mess of a man, and we still had a thousand feet of granite above us. On my next lead, I got off route, wandering up a granite slab to nowhere, and then finally climbing back down. We were barely halfway up the wall and had an, only an hour of daylight left. I finally got back on route and made a belay at the base of a massive flake. When Jean reached my perch, the sun had set. We had several pitches to go, probably 700 feet, and we talked it out. We were both so exhausted, we both couldn't bear to continue in the darkness. We didn't want to go down either because we would have to leave all of our pieces as anchors, hundreds of dollars in gear, our most valuable and important possessions at the time. So we hunkered down our first benightment. Time stopped. A great darkness overcame us. It finally happened. An epic mistake of inefficiency. It was not like some climbing mistakes, though. All we had to do was face the suffering of the moment, not injury or death. Sure, you could die in a benightment if the weather moved in and you or your partner became wet and hypothermic. But the clear, stark sky suggested that would happen. That would not happen. We just had to suffer. And we did. We didn't speak for a while, not out of anger towards one another, but for indifference at the situation. We were supposed to be celebrating on the rim with the darkness below. Instead, we drank nothing. Our water was gone, and we were one with the darkness. The ledge was just enough to sit upon, nothing else. We started to shiver and huddled together, wrapping the rope around us for some warmth. We were too cold and uncomfortable to sleep. An eternity went by, and another eternity. We checked our watch for the time, and we were always disappointed. We talked about what we wanted. We wanted food and water and a woman to hold for warmth. We rubbed each other's shoulders awkwardly, trying to keep warm. We were cold, on the verge of dangerous cold. In the middle of the night, Jeannie dropped his headlamp. It fell 20 feet down in the rock, and we could see it. But there was no way we could get it. 
We waited and waited, and lifetimes seemed to pass by. When that sun hit us, it was the most glorious thing in the world. We greeted the sun as our God. It blessed us with warmth, and we forced ourselves to shoulder on. Climbing should be like this. I knew then and forever. You should have to suffer to attain your dreams. You should have to prove to your dreams that you are worthy. Some dreams, like climbing dreams, demand lives. They demand that young men or women are killed in their prime. Such dangerous dreams do we have as climbers. On day one, I was the weak link. I took too long on my leads and was unable to perform on others. On day two, I had some chance at redemption. Jean was extremely dehydrated and requested that I lead. I obliged, and I felt like I was climbing for the both of us. I guess you always are in a partnership, but this day felt different. This felt like survival climbing, which I guess the activity of climbing has its roots in survival. The second lead of the day involved a traverse with over a thousand feet of air beneath my feet, feeling it out, discovering how the holds felt, and the best way to lean into them. On these leads, I think I discovered I truly was a climber because I didn't hate it. So much had gone wrong. We were out of food and water, and my body felt terrible. But this, the movement upwards for survival, somehow there was a great purpose. Jean felt worse and worse, and depending on me more and more, which somehow made me feel better. We moved at a snail's pace up the wall as it became more and more fractured near the top, and finally it was over. We craved water more than anything. Then we drank the sky. It was so blue that we were blessed to be alive. It was a privilege to suffer. We knew that then. Soon I had what we wished for, more than anything in the world, while freezing and starving on that ledge throughout the night, food, water, and eventually, a woman. So there's a... Uh, Two of us climbers that you're going to hear um, speak tonight, and only one of them is a legend, and that's our next speaker, Lynn Hill. Um, what, I, uh, what I think is the most interesting about Lynn, I mean, most of you guys that are climbers, you know the stories, you know the freeze, scent of the nose, you know her epic fall um, where she fell 80 feet um, after she failed to tie her knot through and landed like a cat and uh, was um, virtually unscathed from that incident. And she's, she's a climbing legend, what else can I say? Um, but what I find the most interesting about Lynn is that she continues that passion. It's not something that she just had um, in her glory days. She's um, incredibly insightful, incredibly awesome to listen to talk to, and uh, I'll just let her do the talking, so. <laughs> myself the accidental leader because I never really intended to be a leader. I feel like I was nominated um, to be a leader and, and the reason that I'm here is because I love climbing. I'm passionate about climbing and I think that by my experiences growing up um, and just you know being a rock climber for the last 40 years um, I've sort of learned a lot of the qualities that you've heard people mention tonight and, and hopefully uh, through the lens of my life as a climber, you'll understand how I became the accidental leader. So, uh, first of all, I have to thank my parents and uh, their genetic history, um, and, and also the nature versus nurture, I think it was both. Um, my parents bravely had seven children. Um, uh, my mother was 24 when she had me, I was number four or five, sorry, and uh, by 28 they had seven kids. So they were accidental leaders too. Uh, they had no idea what they were getting into. <laughs> and uh, my father was an engineer. He finished his studies in Ohio. I was actually born in Michigan. 
I was the last of um, the ones born in Michigan, and uh, my dad worked for the Na National, I mean NASA, Sports or Aerospace Agency, and my mother worked as a dental hygienist. So I don't know how she managed to work part time after the seventh kid was born. I think he was about two when she went back to work. So we were involved in a lot of sports. Um, I, this is me demonstrating years later the telephone pole, or the light pole actually, that I used to climb up because I had never seen a picture of climbing before and I just naturally liked to climb trees and it was just in my blood. Um, somehow it appealed to me and um, fortunately my parents believed in going camping so they used to pile us all up in that station wagon back before they had uh, seat belts and things like that. And, uh, <laughs> We went all over the place. We actually even went all the way back east, all seven of us. But the most memorable experience was coming to Yosemite Valley. Um, I'd never seen a picture of a rock climber. I was 13 years old. You come through this Wolona Tunnel and you see this view of the valley, and it's just awesome. And then as you drive through, you look up at these walls, and it's just unimaginable that somebody could climb them when you're you know, that age and you've never seen a picture of a climber. But at that time, I was really involved in gymnastics, which was perfect preparation for climbing. Um, I was pretty independent as a kid, too, and I think that was part of the uh, nature part of it. Like, I was, I was two and a half years old, and I insisted on tying my own shoelaces, that kind of thing. Um, but being number five, I think when you're in the middle of a group, um, you're not really the leader. You kind of figure things out for yourself, and you have a question you ask an older sibling or something. But I kind of learned to speak softly. And uh, my aunt asked my mother one day, like, does she speak? And, and my older sister, who's only like a year older than me, said, yeah, she speaks, but nobody listens. So I've had to struggle with that, you know, and I'm a small person and I don't speak loud. So I realized that this has had some implications in my life as a leader, and you'll, you'll hear why a little bit later. Um, so I accidentally, even the very first day I went climbing, became a leader because my sister, who her nickname was Mom, uh, she was very much a leader. She liked to be an administrator. She actually works at uh, USC in California in the pharma pharmacology department, and she loves to organize things. So she took my sister and I, who's in between us, climbing for the first time. And she showed us how to tie into the, what's called a Swiss seat. It's just a piece of webbing that you tie around your body. Gave me some shoes that were a little too big. Explained how to tie the knot. And then pointed up, right? You go. So I led my first climb. <laughs> Which is not, you know, standard protocol. Especially on a slab, you know, where there's, there's no real obvious handholds. It's just friction. And... Uh, I said, well, what do you do here? And she's like, just clip into that bolt. And I looked down and I intuitively knew that if I fell, I was gonna go down. Um, so I guess, you know, the, the nature versus nurture, my other sister who had the same experience never climbed again. And uh, after that day, I was trying to find a way to climb as much as possible with my older brother and sister. Um, so sometimes, this is out in Joshua Tree, um, my brother would, and on this uh, climb, got out to the edge of the roof and realized that if he fell, he was gonna slap back down onto the slab and didn't wanna do it. So naively, he asked me if I wanted to do it and I said, sure, I'll try it. And I kinda understood that I might fall onto the slab, but I figured that I could hang on pretty hard. And, and from that point onward, experiences like that kind of reinforced the fact that I could do it if I just tried. So I think that I kind of lucked into um, having the flexibility and the strength and some of the skills, psychological skills also from gymnastics, where you just have to kind of like say, okay, I'm going for it. You run, you do your run up back handspring, boom, double backflip. I'm gonna trust my coach, I'm gonna trust myself. And somehow it's like magic, it actually happens. So I think that that actually helps a lot is learning to trust yourself and to go for it sometimes. And I was pretty curious anyway, and uh, having done a lot of camping trips with my family, I just love to be outside. So um, this is my brother Bob, actually, who climbed with my sister's boyfriend, who's on the top of the Los Cerros Fire here. And uh, 
Those guys were busy climbing themselves. Of course, my sister being afraid of leading her, uh, any climb, she just said, okay, never mind. I don't, I don't feel good, Lynn. You can, you can climb with whoever, you know. And in this case, I met my first boyfriend in Yosemite on that trip. Um, he was two years older than me. I was uh, 16. Um, in this photo, I'm 17. Um, he was 18 and had only been climbing for a couple of years but he grew up in Olinda, which is not far from Yosemite, and he learned to climb walls. So um, we met and did a bunch of free climbing. Um, this is Serenity Crack, where uh, I thought that having small fingers was gonna help me on this hard climb. And what I didn't realize was that, you know, you can get jams for your fingers, but your feet don't really fit in this very thin crack. So it was like the first time I had to like do this log off to try to fiddle in gear. And, I got really pumped and fell and lost my hat. Um, but back in the day, we did not have camps. So um, you can see on the, my rack, it was just passive stoppers that are a little bit more complicated to place. So by the age of 17, um, I met Charlie Rowe back in the valley and uh, got a chance to climb Half Dome, which um, was amazing because in 1974, that was the year that I went to the valley at the age of 13, and uh, I came back to school and there happened to be this copy of National Geographic and I was so excited to try climbing. I hadn't tried it yet, but I knew that people climbed those walls through my sister who had just started climbing, but I still had never gone with her at that point. So three years later, I found myself in the same position as in those photos in National Geographic magazine. So thank God my parents had no idea what I was actually doing in the valley. <laughs> I barely did, actually. No, I did. By that time, um, I was starting to get the hang of, you know, making sure that I placed good gear because when I first started climbing, the first rule was don't fall. Um, because sometimes you just can't. Like in, in this case, um, I was on Astroman and I didn't have very much money to buy gear, so I didn't have very many cams. And, and spring-loaded camping devices were pretty new, so um, I only had a couple. Um, so I just kind of learned to uh, run it out where I could. But those were the days, truly dirtbag days, where I lived for a whole summer on $75. Uh, collected aluminum cans, did a little bit of scarfing, not much, but you know, don't let good food go to waste, right? Um, so I hung out in the valley um, in the summertime, I scraped together money from fast food jobs, minimum wage, um, <coughs> hung out with characters like John Long. Um, this is uh, a group of friends, John Yablonski, Dean Fidelman. Uh, he's the photographer that did a lot of the work that you saw in uh, Stone Master's book and Valley Uprising. Uh, that's me with uh, my eyes closed and, and John Long. And uh, met people like John Backer as well. And we were kind of a community that lived, um, we lived in Southern California, but we would see each other up in the valley in the summertime. There are also some beautiful areas, um, a little bit between the valley and, Cal and Southern Cal, like the needles of California. This is my uh, good friend, Mari Gingri, who I've known for almost 40 years. She was a very important person for me as a woman because Back then, there weren't very many women climbing, and um, we were just accepted as part of the group. And as Mari eloquently said one day, the rock doesn't discriminate. So um, we had our own style and approach that was respected by the guys, and, uh, and we were you know, an encouraging team. We climbed uh, the shield together, it took us six days. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, we didn't really know about the real small pitons, birds, and these uh, knife blades. We just knew the concept that if they didn't go in all the way, you just tie them off and test them. Took a few falls, you know. Definitely got benighted a few times, more than once. Um, back in the day, we had what was called the wonder lamp, and it was a wonder that it ever worked. Um, usually it didn't. So you kind of did get yours to the the school of hard knocks, sometimes you know things wouldn't go the way that you want. And on a big wall, Murphy's Law seemed to be in effect. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Um, I was on a small part of the ledge on the nose, and this is uh, Mari and Dean and I at the summit. 
Um, by the way, Mari and I led everything but one pitch because Dean was afraid. He decided that the height was too much for him, so he's like, you girls, just go ahead and lead. So once, once again, you know, the accidental leader. Um, but I was leaning over to get some water, and I, I just kind of like kicked like that, and my, my foot kicked the food bag out of the hall bag. So we had no food the last day. Um, and I've also been on LCAP with um, no water, kind of at night, just dreaming about water. And fortunately that time, there was a whole bunch of water at the top of the nose, and we just saved. Thinking water, I have to drink some, sorry. With my new cup, thanks to Western University. So the Stone Masters, yes. Very quickly, um, I was adopted into this movement. It was kind of more a philosophy than a real definition of people, but this was one core group, um, this group of people that you see. Um, Mari was in there. I actually was guiding that day to make some money um, instead of just working at fast food places. Um, here's Yabo, who, uh, he's kind of a legendary climber who unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, and I, I definitely got in some scary situations with this guy on routes that were very poorly protected. And in those situations, you realize that you cannot panic. You have to just take that breath of air and think about the situation and, and don't go until you're ready, until you feel the yes. Because if you go when you're feeling stressed, you know, like I've, I've realized this through competition on hard climbs that I've wanted to do, anytime you get that little distraction of fear, it messes you up. So in real situations of danger, you can't do that. And, uh, and I kind of trusted Yabo maybe more than I should have. And one time he said, let's go do the Schnard Herbert. So it's like, okay. We started up and we got really high up and I, get, I handed him the rack and he threw it up in the air to throw his arm through and missed. <laughs> the rack went clanging down to the ground and uh, we sat there and we're like, ah. Oh. Somebody actually gave us three carabiners so we could rappel down. And uh, we got our rack and we sat there and we're like, ah. Oh. And he's like, we should just go for it. It was like three o'clock in the afternoon. It's like, uh, okay, so we did what was called simul climbing, climbing where the first person would go up and the second person would start climbing when the rope came to them, and you just keep climbing together, that way you save time. But there were moments on that where I was like getting on some pretty insecure climbing, and I had no idea if he really had much gear in. So once again, don't fall. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I think Joshua Tree was a great place to learn how to climb because um, old school climbing is very technical, low angle. Um, you have to have perfect precision and weight shifting or else you slip. Um, but it was a lot of fun back then. We didn't take too much, we didn't take ourselves too seriously. Um, we heckled each other and, uh, and had a lot of fun in the process and didn't really make a big deal about um, situations that were a little bit scary. Um, we just kind of took that as part of the lessons that we were learning. And, um, and then we started exploring into new territory. Uh, this is Levitation 29 in Red Rocks of Nevada, uh, one of the first multi-pitch sport climbs in America. And uh, we also found some areas like the Granite Mountain in California near San Jacinto. And uh, you know, after exploring Southern California for a while, um, I started to uh, think about my career as, you know, a professional in some health-related field. I was going to become a physical therapist, and so I decided to, uh, uh, well, you'll see in, a, in this next film clip that I uh, started running because I wanted to earn money from a television show. Um, and I realized that climbing was probably not going to make me a living, you know, I, who's going to pay you to go rock climbing, right? So I decided I'd better get a college education. Um, so I ended up going to like uh, four different colleges. I went to Fullerton Community College, UNLV for a semester, back to Santa Monica College, and then, um, then I moved to New York. So just before moving to New York, um, I did some uh, Hollywood stunt stuff that was kind of cornball. This was confirmation that I needed to get a college education. You'll see why. Mainstream media became increasingly fascinated by extreme sports 
and by the late 70s, I began to earn some cash by performing on a few television shows. For a show called That's Incredible, I made a rope ladder to climb around the outside of a hot air balloon. Though it was a bizarre use of my climbing skills, I was happy for the chance to earn $4,000. show that paid good prize money to the contestants. Strong climbers such as John Backer, Carl Tobin, Ron Kaup, and Tony Yanero, as well as professionals from other sports competed in this annual event. The possibility of earning a large cash prize inspired us to push for the comfort zone. My winnings in this competition over the next four years, in addition to my earnings in other television shows, helped pay for my college education inspired me to start running and opened up many new unexpected opportunities. Yeah. So, so I ended up moving to upstate New York, um, town of New Paltz. Uh, to finish my college education. Um, it was a great change for me because it was such a different culture and it um, gave me an insight into a completely different uh, way of living in, in our country. You know, I, I grew up in California and it seems like a different country in the East Coast sometimes. Um, the rock was different, the climbing community was different. Um, I continued to push my level as a rock climber and, and also as a track climber because um, the roots are very overhanging with horizontal cracks so you have to learn how to place uh, oppositional gear like that and it's quartzite rock um, so this is kind of typical a lot of overhanging formations um, so this was also a transition of style not just in clothing um, but um, back in the mid 80s um, Traditional style climbing was pretty solid here in the country. Um, you weren't allowed to hang on a root. If you fell, you had to go straight back down. You weren't allowed to look at anything from above. And we were pretty strict about all that. So it was kind of slow progress coming from the ground if you wanted to do something really hard, because if you fell, you had to just come back down. So this climb, Vandals, was a little bit of a a change of style for me because, well actually the story goes like this, I was walking by the base and there were sky hooks taped on the rock and these guys were like, uh, Linny, you're really light, you should go up first to get the gear in, once again the accidental leader. And I was like, okay, well I'll, I'll try that. So I got in uh, some gear in this horizontal at the bottom of the frame of this picture here and then pushed up on the upper face and there was just a really small RP behind a flake. And then the next person got all the way up to the roof. And uh, actually, that flake broke off because my friend Russ Kloon, um, on his attempt, he fell and broke it off. But anyway, it was kind of back in the days where you were pushing difficulty and the gear wasn't all that great. And uh, just so happened that from the vertical face to the roof, there was a move that kind of hurt my shoulder. And I just thought it was kind of silly to keep going back down to the ground and hurting my shoulder again. So I said, you know, hold here for a second because I can't see this hold in the middle of the roof. And so I hung on. And uh, I knew that that was cheating according to you know, the ethical style of the day, but I figured that as long as I wasn't hurting anyone and I was honest about the way I climb with other people, that that was not a bad thing. Um, so I, I'd actually heard of this guy, Wolfgang Gulick, um, who climbed uh, in Germany. He's a German climber. Unfortunately, he passed away in a car accident in, uh, I think it was 91. But he pushed the level of free climbing um, from 514A, 514B. I think he skipped C and went straight to D. And, uh, and he was known as a hangdogger in, in the valley. And I remember him giving me a picture of this guy, Baron Arnold. In East Germany, they climb barefoot. You're not allowed to use um, any kind of passive metal protection devices. They just had a minimum of five meters between bolts. 
So it's pretty bold. You were allowed to do shenanigans like that um, to get the bolts in, but you had to be pretty brave and uh, you could never start from the top. Sometimes they would do this ridiculous sport of jumping that sometimes would end up poorly. Like I, I saw this footage of a guy missing and whapping back in and breaking his ribs on one of these towers. Um, but it was ironic to me that Wolfgang was criticized for hangdogging and yet he pushed the level um, beyond. Um, so in the, in the 80s, there was this t-shirt, the devil is a hangdog, very representative of that time period where it was very conflicted with climbers. And in 86, there was a debate in uh, Denver, oh, that's supposed to say calc, sorry, um, non calc, not call. Um, and uh, so there was half of the, the climbers were traditional climbers and half were sport climbers, like Todd Skinner was more on the sport climbing side. And the issues were wrap, wrap place bolts and hang dogging. So um, I was right in the middle. I told my story of what happened on Vandals and, uh, and everybody you know, said what they thought about it. And pretty soon um, that wasn't really an issue anymore because places like Smith Rocks, Oregon, uh, people realized that it was so much fun and there's no way you're gonna put gear in a face like that. So the bolts were accepted and, and your style was your style. And, and then American climbers started catching up to what European climbers were starting to do back in that same time period. Um, so this is uh, in Buttes, which is one of the first sport climbing areas in France. So I was actually invited to come over to France on an exchange with the French and the American Alpine Club. And uh, I went climbing in the Verdun. And at the time, this woman, Catherine Destevel, was quite famous for having done a film um, in the Verdun Gorge along with uh, Patrick Edlanger. And uh, he was on primetime TV and free soloing. And it just it blew everybody away. And, and I think free climbing in France just took off. So um, we were invited to come visit uh, the Fuchs, Verdun, um, a place called Le Soussois outside of um, Paris, and uh, Fontainebleau, back before they had crash pads, if you can believe that. Um, so um, I'd heard about these competitions in Europe. Um, my, my tour was in 86, and I knew about this international climbing competition in 85, because my friend Russ Kloon, who was also involved in that vandals climb, had gone, and uh, he was a friend of Wolfgang Gluck's, and uh, this guy Manolo is also a very famous Italian climber, who actually never did compete. There were some people that said, no, I don't want to do it, it's not my thing, it's not what climbing's about, and there were other people that saw it as an interesting um, form of climbing. So um, after my tour there, I met one of the organizers of that competition who invited me back um, that same summer to compete in Italy. And it was much different than competing in gymnastics or some of the other sports that I did as a kid um, because climbing is usually done with your friends in a very casual environment um, in nature. And it was just so weird that they had kind of altered the rock. They, apparently cut down some trees and uh, even put some glue in, in the rock to make it harder or easier or whatever. And uh, they weren't too sure about how to organize the rules and uh, even change the rules a little bit. But um, it was difficult to try to quantify um, how to measure competitions. And uh, the first couple of years they had it on natural rock, which I still would prefer, but I understand that um, that's really not a sustainable way to have a competition. So eventually they did move them onto walls, uh, artificial walls, a little bit after that. Um, this was actually the, the first outdoor competition in France, um, first of its kind actually, in, in southern France, in uh, the Pyrenees. And uh, I was really blown away by the difference in culture, um, how much the Europeans embraced the art form of climbing. And uh, these guys, Marc Le Minestrel's brother Antoine, um, still today practices dance escalade, does like impromptu street performance and uh, some really creative stuff. Um, 
So this is actually in a sports stadium in the center of Paris. Um, one of the first of these really interesting walls with voluminous structures sticking out. Um, turns out that it wasn't as successful as a sport to watch for the uh, stadiums like that, so they never really continued doing them in the sports stadium like that. But um, in 1988, they had the first outdoor competition on an artificial wall in the United States here in Snowbird. And uh, it was kind of a primitive design, but I think it made a big impact on American climbing and, and people suddenly realized that climbing was going to become a sport. Um, but for me, what it meant was I could push my level of free climbing, um, earn a little bit of prize money, and, and go to places like Smith Rocks or out west, because at the time I was still living in New York. So in New York, you obviously can't climb in the winter, and there were no climbing gyms. So uh, if I wanted to climb, I would buy a ticket out west. Um, back to my uh, stomping grounds in California. So back then, I was still doing a lot of Trad climbing, um, pushing my level in places like the, the New River Gorge, um, also out in um, Colorado, where I live now. I live right down the street from El Dorado Canyon. And uh, in between competitions, I uh, picked this objective to try to do a 514. And um, it's kind of ironic, one of the first people I met in France on that tour said to me, a woman will never on site a 12D, and I went, I just looked at him like, really? How could you say something like that? To me, it's just unthinkable that you would put a limit on somebody like that. Um, and so ironically, here's the route that he did the first ascent of, and it was my first 514. And then uh, a couple years later after that, um, unfortunately, I was climbing in Germany, and I heard about Wolfgang Gulick's car accident. He was um, alive, but you know, kept alive on machines. And so I, um, I decided that he was such an inspirational person to me, following his passions and you know, being a good spokesperson for the sport and a really kind person, that I would try to do my first 8A on site. And uh, Jive happened to be at the same cliff, and he did that same climb, and I didn't watch him. And then I did it on site that day, but it was really, um, the inspiration of Wolfgang's life that inspired me, and Jibe was there that day. So it was kind of a nice conclusion to that, um, that story. So eventually I moved to France and uh, was close to places like the Verdun Gorge, Chamonix, um, and later on I, I moved also to Italy. And uh, so in the process, it was great to be like a child again and learn to speak a new language, so I would climb, and then, you know, two days on, one day off, kind of vacation climbing style, uh, compared to what the people do today that compete in competitions, they climb really hard, many hours a day, with very few rest days, but anyway, I had time to learn French, and then having learned French, it's a Latin language, um, it helped me learn Italian, so that was really a lot of fun, and gave me insight into the old world, and just you know, kind of gives you a chance to question yourself as an American, um, this, the assumptions that we have. And I think that back to the theme of leadership, um, it's really important to question authority. Like the stone master's ethic and uh, culture was really much about that, question um, your assumptions. Because as we evolve and, and things change, um, we have to have a new look at things, just like with the hang dogging. So, I believe in always questioning things, constantly questioning things, and, uh, and that same curiosity and childlike mind was good also to learn languages. So um, I embrace all those, um, those influences, and, and I kind of like being a little bit out of my comfort zone because um, that's where I find the most growth. And uh, even in what we call failure, or maybe you don't achieve what you set out to do, um, you learn a lot in the process, and that's, I think, uh, a valiant effort regardless. So um, after I decided to retire from competitions, um, I decided that I had a lot of fitness, and I had this experience now from climbing traditional style, all different types of rock, 
um, from granite and all the different conglomerate, and quartzite and sandstone, um, and then limestone. And then even the mindset that you have to have in competition where they say, okay, it's your turn to compete now. You have to be able to go out there and say, okay, take a breath, it's that same patience that I was describing before, and, uh, and do your best. And I think all of those skills were useful on the nose. And, um, and it was, I, I decided to retire from comps because I wanted to grow in a new way. And I, I felt like that was not a sustainable future for me. And it really wasn't what climbing represented to me either. Um, indoor climbing was a whole new thing. And um, it didn't teach the same kind of subtlety and creativity that outdoor climbing does. Even though I, I do climb on gym, you know, artificial walls, it's fun. It's a, it's a totally different thing. Um, but I wanted to take all of those skills and do something meaningful. And so I guess in that sense, I took on um, that nomination of being a leader because um, in reading some of the old literature back in the days of um, Warren Harding and uh, Galen Rao and that generation who really pioneered the first ascents in the valley, there weren't any other women that were doing that. And uh, in Galen Rao's book, published in the 90s, he wrote something that said, um, um, excuse me, or no, uh, there are no women in this book, and I make no apologies here because there simply were no women doing <clears throat> significant first ascents in the formative times of Yosemite. So I thought, wow, that's true. There was Beverly Johnson, who you'll see in a few minutes here, who is my personal role model. And obviously people like Royal Robbins, who was all about style, and uh, you know they were dealing with um, making up their own equipment. You know the famous stove legs; they had to take a, uh, the leg of a stove to fit into these wide cracks, well, actually wide like that. And uh, you know they had epics. And uh, and then clean climbing came about, where they were not using so much um, hammering and pitons; they were using removable protection devices. And then people started, um, well, in this case, this is Beverly Johnson and Sibylla Hechtel. They started doing firsts like the first female team of El Capitan. And then I remember when I was about 17 years old, Beverly Johnson was on the news because she spent nine days soloing um, by herself on the dihedral wall, which I thought was pretty amazing. Even though it wasn't a first ascent, she was a role model for me and very important to me. So I felt like, you know, that was something that I should be doing now. If, if she was an important person to me, then I should do that for other women. So um, Billy Westbay's brother, Steve, is here in the audience. Um, he's the guy here on uh, your left. Um, sorry to declare he's not so good here, but uh, this is a picture very famous you've probably seen. Um, after the first one day ascent of the nose. And that was incredible back then. Um, these guys were going for it. Um, they didn't have uh, the friends that we have today that are the remote, or uh, sorry, the spring loaded camming devices. So it was a little bit slower going. Um, but that was one breakthrough that was significant. And then Todd Skinner and Paul Piana's first free ascent of the South Bay Wall back in 1988. Um, that was a visionary next step because people weren't free climbing big walls. Um, and that was for the cliffs. And uh, once you got up off the ground, it's very comforting to stay in those atriates. You know, the idea of standing out of them and just free climbing, is, it is something that takes a little bit of getting used to. But I find that once you decide your style, it's harder to switch. So when I went there to free climb, I just looked at it as a free climb. So it all depends on your perspective. Um, then in 1992, I, I teamed up with Hans Floring to try um, speed climbing the nose. Actually, that was his idea um, because he had the, the climb wired and he currently holds the record. I think it's like two hours and 23 minutes or 22 minutes, ridiculously fast. Um, those guys are running up the route. But we did it in like eight hours and 15 minutes. And so my intention was just to see if I thought it would be possible to free climb it um, because it seemed like 
an interesting combination of all those skills of climbing. And, and also John Long, uh, when I visited him, said, hey, Lenny, you ought to try free climbing the nose. That'd be a great objective. And I was like, ah, yes, you're right. So um, it's kind of a long story um, how the first free ascent came about in 93. Um, but like the Murphy's Law that I mentioned before, um, things don't always go like you think. Um, I had partners bailing out. I had all kinds of ethics. And I eventually happened across my friend Simon Maiden, who I'd met at the competitions um, in 1988. He entered his first competition. By the end of the year, he was the World Cup champion. So that tells you how good he was. But he'd never been on a wall. And uh, he agreed to be my partner. And from the ground, um, we got up to the great roof and spent most of the day working out the sequence. And um, by the end of the day, I barely made it past there. And I thought, wow, I did the great roof. We were going to do this. And I had no idea what uh, lie ahead. And, and the changing corners pitch was much more difficult. Um, we'd run out of food. Um, Simon actually had a better shot at doing it. Um, but he wasn't able to do the, free, or the great roof free. Um, so um, it was not looking like we could do this changing corners pitch because we were just too tired and uh, our skin was worn. So we were like, okay, this, this is not going to work out. So we had to go to the top. He flew back to England. Um, and I, f I flew to my mother's house in Idaho for a little family reunion. And, and at that time when I left, I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to do the route. I was kind of like, well, that was a valiant effort, but it didn't go. And, uh, but then I thought, well, it has to go. It's a corner, even if it's like sort of a, you know, not a very good angle for opposition. It must be possible. So I came back with my friend Brooke Sandal, who had put some time into pioneering a little variation on the last pitch, which is not easy. Um, it's a pretty steep little bulge there that kind of zigzags uh, in the beginning to the right of where the, the overhanging bolt ladder goes and then back left. Um, so here is him on this variation that he figured out. He thought it would be great to just go up the face and then traverse in to the corner where it was possible to climb. But that section there, that's where Simon actually, I thought, was, looked like he could do it because you're kind of in an iron cross. And then there's one little tiny tooth of a foothold that it was too low. I couldn't do both. And you know, then you have to do this magic move where you kind of match on this nothingness and then go to the right. So it, it wasn't going to work for me. And I thought, well, I, I think it'll go in the, in the corner. So you start out doing this sort of iron cross move. And then you figure out, you'll see the footage later, um, you figure out how to get into the corner. Uh, but when I was with Simon, there was an old piton that was in the only spot where you could get a finger lock. So with, with Brooke, we, we came in from the top, pulled out that piton, and spent three days working on that section. And even though it was really hot and not very windy, um, I'd linked, I didn't link all the moves, but I, I did all the moves, and I figured that in nice conditions it would go. And that's actually what happened. So. We hiked back to the ground and uh, free climbed the whole route in four days. And it seemed kind of like amazingly mellow. Um, everything went pretty well. We didn't have any epics, actually. Um, this is the famous changing corners pitch. Um, pretty touch and go style climbing. You can see it's, it's the kind of thing where if you have any doubt in your head and your foot goes a millimeter off, you slip. So. Um, Anyway, that was in 93. Um, this is the last pitch I was mentioning. There's like just a little tiny two finger thing with my right hand there. And, and there's like 3,000 feet <coughs> underneath. And, and it, I'm on the edge of an overhanging bulge there. Um, so it was, it was a great feeling to have free climbed the nose, um, this historic route that people said would never go. And, um, I decided that the next year, uh, well, I'm going to let you watch a, a film clip, which will explain it, and then I'll go into more detail after this clip. Standing on the summit with Brooke after making the first free ascent of the nose was certainly a memorable experience. However, a few months later, an even greater challenge came to mind. 
to make an all free ascent of the nose in one day. To be successful, I would need to be in the best shape of my life since the most difficult sections on the route are located after nearly 2,000 feet of climbing. During that period, I lived in the Provence region in southern France where there are plenty of limestone cliffs located nearby. Throughout the months of training, I practiced using only as much energy as necessary to hang on to each hole. I discovered that the most fluid and beautiful movements are best achieved when all my muscles are relaxed except those that are absolutely necessary. When I arrived in the valley the following summer, I was honored to have the chance to meet up with Warren Harding. He shared a few stories about his climbing experiences and wished us the best of luck on our journeys. I started out by reviewing key sections of the climb since there was such a wide variety of techniques and details to remember on such a long climb. My intention was to free climb this route in the state that I found it, which was not entirely natural due to pin scars, fixed pitons, and even a few chipped holds on the Jardine Traverse. Though the chipped foothold on the start of this pitch was helpful, I would have preferred to try free climbing this section in its natural state, since the spirit of free climbing is about adapting my personal dimensions to the natural features of the rock, not the other way around. document this effort was a lot to manage while preparing for the most challenging climb of my life. After placing the long static ropes for the film team, the chief cameraman promptly refused to do any filming since he wasn't used to working in such exposed locations. Instead, I took advantage of this time to review the most difficult sections on the great roof, the glamouring spot, and the changing corners pitch. By the time I was ready to attempt the climb from the ground, I was already exhausted. It didn't help that Steve had forgotten his belay device. I already had an ominous feeling about the fate of the day. My fears were confirmed later on that day when I failed to free climb past the great roof. Since we only had one rope and no belay device, the easiest way down was up. Well, <laughs> what? yeah, I tried very hard on the great roof. I got to almost the last move crossing under, and each time, well, in the beginning, my foot slipped. We made a few errors. I had no chalk, and it was scorching hot. We had very little water. So in between tries, came down to the belay, sat in the sun, and each time I'd go up and I'd try to get some chalk out of my bag, and there was nothing, and my hands were just greasing out of the crack. It was not not good planning. A few errors makes a big difference on such a big wall. I took several days to rest, regroup, and cultivate a more positive state of mind. Inspired by a 70-year-old Chinese Qigong master, I imagined tapping into an infinitely powerful source of energy and rising upward in its current. On September 19th at 10 p.m., I decided to make another attempt, only this time by the light of the full moon. I climbed through the night so I would arrive underneath the great roof during the cool hours of the morning. This time, I arrived underneath the great roof in perfect conditions, feeling strong and relaxed.
I was quite happy to have led me at this pitch without a fall. Though I had an unexpected scare when my protection fell out on an insecure section of the glowering spot pitch, I was able to find another piece of protection and continue climbing to the belay. My ultimate goal was to free climb the entire route without a fall, but these hopes vanished after falling on the changing corners pitch. After my third failed attempt, my strength was waning. I knew this would be perhaps the most meaningful ascent of my life, so I tried to cultivate the right state of mind. I thought about all the people in my life who had inspired and supported me. I thought about compassion and about connecting with that infinite source of energy. This would be my last try so I prepared to do whatever necessary to carry out my intention. When I finally arrived at the summit, it felt like a dream come true. ropes on it, but the, the best repeat has been done by Tommy Caldwell and Beth Rodden since, um, and you'll see some more stuff later on, but I just wanted to say a few words about um, just the spirit of free climbing this route and what it meant to me, and um, I think that a lot of people said, oh yeah, she could do it because she had small fingers, which was kind of funny, um, but I, I think the real point here is that um, with passion and discipline and training and preparation and all that stuff and faith in yourself, you can do what you set out to do. And I think that's really important for you guys as students to understand that you do need to follow your passions and believe in yourself and work really hard and you can make it. And, and if at first you don't succeed, you gotta keep trying. Try new methods, because that's kind of what I had to do on this route, is keep trying different things and uh, keep believing in myself and, and working with people that believed in me. And I think you know any team, any company, any kind of group needs to have that kind of dynamic. And climbing is usually one person, your partner, that you're relying on, but that's a really important bond. And my friend Steve did a lot of help, you know, like he revolted some things, of course with the hand drill, because you're not allowed to use a motor drill in Yosemite. And we did that so that people would be safe behind us. And um, I tried to, to leave it in uh, the same kind of shape for an A climber as for a free climber. But yet, if you wanted to free climb it, you would have you know, the bolts where you need it. But it wouldn't change the challenge for an A climber. So I actually only had Steve put one bolt in, the one you see here. Um, Scott Burke, who repeated it the one a couple years later, put in another bolt, which made it a lot easier for A climbers. And I didn't really complain because I think it's a lot better for the free climbing. Because um, you can see that this corner is pretty sharp. And if you only have one rope 
and the rope is going up and around the corner where the gear was before, it's a little scary. Uh, so I think, you know, for me, climbing is, is also a consideration of other people. Uh, it's not just my ascent, it's how you lead the rock for other people. And, um, you know, sometimes you just want to leave a nice route that's fun for people and not leave something that's, you know, dangerous that you were able to do because you did some things that were, um, I don't know, not reported or a little bit an advantage as opposed to somebody who's coming up on site and trying to do your route. Um, I think it's just something to think about is um, be fair to other people and, and leave a nice route for them to do. Um, so I, I'm really happy to be um, part of the history of climbing and, and help inspire people like Beth Rodden. Um, she's here with Tommy Caldwell in this picture on the Lurking Fear. As most of you know, Tommy is uh, the big hero of Yosemite. Um, he's done 11 of the free routes on El Cap, um, including, of course, the Don Wall. And um, other people like Steph Davis um, has repeated the free rider at the South Bay and, and since gotten into some of that crazy base jumping stuff. Um, and Dean Potter, who kind of did his own kind of innovation on big wall free climbing and rope soloing. So he basically free solos in between uh, sections where he might need to use the rope. And most of the time it's on his back, and, unless it's hard. Um, and then Alex Honnold, who brought that to a whole new level when he free soloed the entire face of Half Dome. Um, and he's just an amazing climber. Uh, makes me nervous watching him. Um, I wouldn't do that, especially as a mother. Um, but he's, he really is uh, somebody who controls risk in a really interesting way. Um, I'll tell you a story in a second here. Um, so I uh, came back to the Leaning Tower um, when my son was about two and a half years old. Um, I teamed up with Katie Brown, who was just getting into traditional style climbing. Um, she was one of the most amazing sport climbers in her day, very, very natural climber. And so when she asked me to climb with her, I said, of course, yes, I'll, I'll do this with you. So um, we ended up free climbing the Westy face, it's called. Really amazing route. Um, even the so-called 511s on this, this wall here are pretty stout. Um, so this year, in January, I was invited to come back to Yosemite. Um, this is Tommy right after the, top, the Don Wall. Um, He'd just gotten off the Don Wall, probably took a few showers, saw his wife and kid, and then uh, hiked back up to help out on this photo shoot. Um, and he's still friends with Beth. They're not married anymore. Beth is married to somebody else, and they're both married to somebody else with um, little babies. And it was great to see them. Um, and Alex Honnold was also on this uh, photo shoot, which I'm not allowed to tell you much about. Um, but in a few months, um, I'll put a link on my website, which is Lynn Hill Climbing, and, and you'll see the results of this photo shoot. But what was interesting was hanging out with these guys and just chatting with them and getting some insight about how they feel. Um, uh, Tommy was getting ready to do a, uh, a talk for Microsoft with Kevin about um, teamwork. And it was just, just interesting to hear him talk. And I found myself um, talking about kind of a theme that touches on leadership. And, um, and I said, well, Tommy, you know, I think it's really interesting that you and Kevin did have this teamwork. I mean, you weren't equal partners in, in all ways, but that's what leadership is. It's like using the skills of all the different people, respecting their contribution, because it's not going to be the same, and, uh, and working together on a common goal. And um, so, I don't know. In our discussion on uh, El Cap Tower, if that helped, you know. But uh, it was interesting. I drew some things out. And then, as far as Alex Honnold goes, asking him a little bit about his life, found, found out that his mom speaks French to him all the time. She's not French, but she loves France. And, uh, and then I found out his dad passed away at the age of 55 of a heart attack walking through an airport. And uh, it, it kind of dawned on me, maybe this is just my assumption, that he probably felt like my dad could die at 55, I should just go for it in my life and just 
you know, do what I love to do because life is short. And so I kind of, that's my conclusion on how he could be so calm in the face of, you know, these free solos where he's literally hanging, you know, on these tiny little edges that he considers big and safe and no problem. And he's like, okay. <laughs> and he's able to really keep that fear down to a minimum. So anyway, these are the people behind the scenes on that shoot. Um, that's on El Cap Tower. And uh, since I, one of the photographs was at the end of the Great Roof, I took a picture. There's a little bit of moss under there, a piece that's half sticking out. You know, and this is what people go across all the time on the nose. Kind of interesting. And that's Alex following up the pitch. And uh, it was a great place to hang out and uh, just put everything into a different light. You know, just going through uh, the route from the top down, my descent of the nose, I'll call it. Uh, so. Just thinking about, you know, one of those times when I was climbing in the dark behind Texas Flake that's, you know, there's really not very much protection behind this gigantic flake um, at night, which is sort of an eerie feeling. And just the whole progression of time, you know, from the Warren Hardy days of, you know, the hemp ropes and, and the rats that bit almost all the way through this one rope and this guy's prissicking up the rope and it broke. And the guy landed back down on a ledge. He didn't die. But like epics like this that have happened in so many people's history that have happened on that route. Um, and then just to come down it and then pull into a position, it almost seemed easier. And, and I don't know if it's the passage of time or just the, the way that I got there from the top down. Um, but anyway, so here's Beth Rodden at the age of 19. And uh, this is a real. Uh, the biggest lesson in leadership that I've ever had, where I was asked to be the leader of a women's expedition to Madagascar. And my idea was to do uh, a story about free climbing and the beauty of free climbing in Sardinia, which is where Beth and, and my friend Nancy Fagan were. Um, but they, the, the plan was to move on and go to Madagascar, where we'd have a real adventure. And uh, so we met uh, another uh, person of the team that was Kat Pike and, uh, and Beth Rodden, of course, and myself. So we, we pioneered this new route on a <coughs> almost 2,000 foot face um, from the ground up, mostly placing bolts on the lead. There was a couple of cracks like this one. Um, and it was pretty adventurous, you know, because you don't want to get hurt in a place like that. If you get hurt in Madagascar, there is no rescue within hours and hours just to get to base camp. It's a couple hours hike and you can kind of get lost through the forest. So it was pretty serious stuff. And, and I felt really responsible for Beth because she'd never really done any multi-pitch climbing. And as the leader of this expedition, I realized that number one, my soft voice or maybe my lack of emphatic insistence um, led to some people not listening to my instruction, like, oh, measure those ropes, and it turned out to backfire um, when I was at the end of my 70-meter uh, pitch. I'm pulling up the extra ropes, and they're five feet short, because I asked for them to be 70 meters, and they weren't. And so I pull up one rope too short, pull up the second rope too short. The third rope gets stuck behind a flake, and I'm up there with one carabiner, one locking carabiner, and I, I was planning to pull my greenery up so I could descend and leave a fixed rope. Anyway, um, it ended up causing a little bit of turmoil amongst the team members because Nancy said that I was being dangerous because I, let, I didn't bring up the right ropes and I didn't bring my GMARs down. And there was this kind of, I think it, there's a lot of tension that happens on a trip like this, especially when there's a film involved, a lot of stress. And sometimes ego gets involved. And uh, I realized then that to be a good leader, you have to be clear in your communication. You have to include everybody and respect everybody, show your appreciation for their contributions, and uh, be compassionate. You know, I didn't expect Beth to lead any of this really steep stuff. One day I asked her to follow the one pitch that I thought was kind of sketchy, and, she, and I said, don't climb with anything you don't want to climb with. She put on a backpack on 512D. By the end of the pitch, she was crying. And, uh, and I felt bad, you know, I, maybe I didn't shout loud enough. Um, 
but she ended up leaving early on that trip, and it just felt like, you know, I would have liked to have her there on the last day, but I think she felt overwhelmed. So as, as a leader, I felt like I didn't bring the group in um, as well as I could have, and uh, you know, I did do a lot of the leading and a lot of the scary leading, um, but that's not all that's involved in, in being a, a good leader. But I have to say that I think I did inspire Beth um, because after that she went back to Yosemite, met Tommy Caldwell, um, and learned to become quite a competent uh, trad climber, and she's done the hardest crack climb in Yosemite called Meltdown. So I was pretty proud to see that Beth took that initiative to uh, learn to trad climb. The one unfortunate turn was um, in 2000, when those guys went to Kyrgyzstan, um, they decided to kind of uh, go to a place that I'd actually been in 1995, um, it's former Soviet Republic, and we took a helicopter to this remote location for two and a half weeks. No uh, satellite phone. Um, this is a picture actually of Kitty Calhoun who was four months pregnant. That was pretty bold. I don't think she did much leading, um, but we were a team of uh, very skilled alpine climbers. I was the one learning from them because though I was you know, experienced on big wall, rock climbing, um, when it comes to snow and ice, I wasn't. People like Conrad Anker, um, who's here doing some watercolor painting. Um, so I'm, I'm in my element on rock, but on my way down from this climb, um, there was some snow and, uh, and I was just, I used an ice axe to kind of make sure that, you know, I was gonna slide down. And Conrad looks at that one moment, he goes, oh, there's a point release avalanche. And I look up and I see this big piece of snow coming at me and it hits me, knocks me off. I do a self arrest and stop before a little bit of a, a crevasse. And, uh, and that kind of made me realize that the mountains are really a serious place. And uh, so here I teamed up with Craig, I mean, uh, Greg Child, and uh, <clears throat> climbed even longer than on the nose. This took us like 36 hours climbing all night long. Um, we ended up sleeping at the summit. We were so tired. Um, that's how I looked, <laughs> <laughs> exhausted. I think since then, the, the descents and things are a lot easier. Um, we had to scramble down. This death gully was loose rock flying by our heads and everything. So um, on this trip, I kind of really questioned, like, do I really like this realm of alpine rock climbing? Um, honestly, I found it to be quite scary. And uh, this whole idea of free climbing, every move seemed a little absurd when um, Really, the idea is to get up and down safely, and free climbing is a really good tool to get past places that are difficult very quickly. So uh, I was glad that I was a good free climber because here on this pitch, I couldn't see where the next piece of pro was. And uh, climbing in shoes that are a little big, a um, little bit extra gear, and it's pretty heady up there. So, and we were in the other valley, on the other side of where um, our camp was. But uh, what happened to um, Tommy and Beth when they went um, in 2000 was they were in this side of the valley as well. They were up on some wall a couple hundred feet up and they heard this gunshot. And it was these uh, fundamentalists that made them come down and they raided their camp and took their food and, and a lot of their warm clothing and stuff and then made them go on this march for like six days. And if there was a helicopter from the Kyrgyz military, they were told to hide underneath a bush or they'd be shot. And they witnessed one of the military people get shot by these people. And Tommy, being one of the great leaders, um, in my opinion, you know, just not as a rock climber, but like in this moment, um, he realized that there was only one gunman. They were hiking up a steep slope and he went, okay, this is our chance. He pushed the guy off. The guy went down and he felt really bad because he thought he might have killed the guy. But they ran 10 miles down valley and were saved by the military camp. And it was because of his thinking on his feet, literally. And uh, so luckily we did not have that kind of experience, but um, this is Alex Lowe at the top of a 4,000 foot wall that I, I did team freestyle with him. We've lost one of our ropes mysteriously. I uh, decided to continue on. 
and just do twice as many repels, which was kind of scary, especially since I'm the light one again, and I had to be the one to wrap on one piece sometimes. One of those times was like on one homemade Russian recuperated uh, stopper that uh, Alex had found on the route. <laughs> uh, but here he's, we're at the base, happy to be down on the ground, and uh, he's holding a picture of his two children. Um, he called his wife on his way home and found out that there was a third, and that third child is in college now himself. He was about 18 years old. So um, it was amazing to uh, travel through places like Istanbul on our way back, and uh, I decided at that point I wanted to explore the world and see different places, and uh, it's pretty much what I did in places like Morocco, um, going to places in the Sahara Desert. Such a beautiful place, no uh, pollution of noise, and look up at the sky, and there's so many beautiful stars. Um, visited Australia that I've heard about for many years. Um, kind of an interesting mix of uh, like, California sort of traditional style ethics um, and English ethics because the Australians actually um, share a, between the American culture and the English culture, even in their climbing. And uh, this was a wild formation, the uh, totem pole at the end of uh, Tasmania. And I went to Vietnam, um, a place that ironically um, you think about in connection with the war, and it's just one of these countries that is so adaptable. The people um, have been through so many wars, and um, they're just uh, able to just move very quickly into um, whatever they need to do to survive. So we ended up hiring this guy that had a boat, and we call these uh, reed boats, our basket boat. And uh, I learned to bolt from the water up by myself. Um, so. Todd Skinner was actually kind of in charge of this trip, and he's like, okay, we want to do maximum number of routes, so here, take this drill and go do a route. And uh, it was kind of scary. Um, on this route that I bolted, um, they dropped me off on this wall by myself, and they left, and there was nobody around. I was all by myself. Um, this is a, a nice little example of the low tide. And these stalactites are humongous, um, and Todd pointed out that they're actually mud inside, so you couldn't really trust them completely. Um, but it was interesting to um, talk with these local people. I had a translator, an American that could speak Vietnamese, and uh, they were asking me, what are you guys looking for up there? And, uh, and I tried to explain, it was like Tai Chi, you know, like they were all laughing at me, they thought that was hilarious. But um, just being on the boats with these people, I, I realized that their happiness has nothing to do with their material comforts. They're just really simple people and very happy people. Some of the happiest people I've seen, actually, are some of the poorest in, in material goods. Also in this place, China, I had the pleasure of going there on the Petzl Rock trip. You notice there's a person that looks like a stalactite in the middle of that gigantic cave. This is like a four pitch roof. That's uh, on the other side of that arch. But it's been really fun to be a part of this international community and I think that uh, that's one of the great things about farming is that no matter where you're from, uh, we share a lot of the same values and uh, language and culture don't seem as important as the, the culture of climbing and the appreciation of those simple values. So after all these travels, seeing people in their local communities and um, how happy they are in this very simple way of life, I decided to have a kid. And uh, better late than never, I was 42 when I had my son Owen. Um, he's doing like a one-arm pull up here out of the womb. Uh, <laughs> actually, I, I had a, cesare or a yeah, cesarean and the doctor's actually laughing because he's noticing my son like this. He knows that I'm a climber. And uh, this is at about seven months old with uh, his godfather, Dean Potter, who was born on the very same day, April 14th, coming up. And uh, people always ask me, is your son a climber? And uh, you know, he has all of the qualities of a climber, uh, even his temperament, his determination. 
He's, uh, he doesn't have a lot of fear. He's pretty open. And it might have had something to do with traveling around with uh, the village, so to speak. Um, when he was only 10 months old, we went to Cuba. That was a pretty amazing experience. Um, we uh, set up a slack line in Havana and taught the locals how to slack line a little bit. And then the locals here in uh, Vinales, which is where the climbing is, um, these twins are holding on to our babies and babysitting. And it's just a really nice culture. Uh, this is the hilarious Timmy O'Neill borrowing a clown's costume. He's, he's one of the funniest people I know. And uh, meeting some of the local climbers who are um, really good at salsa dancing. Uh, this is the town of Vignales. And one of the routes that we left for the locals, Viva la Libertad. And, uh, and this is the crew in, in town. So since then, I've taken my son on various trips, that's in El Potrero, Chico, taking him to Italy. And yes, he does climb a little bit. Um, and doesn't matter what language, like he was speaking English and this little boy was speaking Italian, no problem, those guys were buds. Um, and here's my son who's got very good balance. I don't know if it has anything to do with things like this, but uh, I think he probably has good proprioceptor awareness or something. Um, but my son actually, would say to you that he's not a climber. He, it's not his thing. Um, and he does climb and he's pretty natural at it. He's more into parkour, which um, I'm happy to support you know, something different than climbing. Uh, he likes to play the drums. Uh, you know, it's probably good for a kid to be their own person. So um, I totally support that. And uh, at the same time, I think he should be a part of the, the crew. This is some old friends, my friend Marty Gingery sitting right behind Owen, who's uh, got a bag in his hand there, and Michael Klinsky on the right. So I've been you know, friends with those guys forever. And so um, at this point in my life, I, I spend a lot of time raising my son, and I'm working on a technique video. And um, I, I think that for me, climbing is mostly intuitive. So you have, I don't know if it's literally true anymore, the right brain, left brain idea, but um, I'm very analytical, but I'm very intuitive. So what you're seeing here is the analytical part. I'm trying to break down climbing and show points of opposition here. Um, oftentimes we're supported by three points. Um, and you know, so I'm just showing some things whoops, um, about technique. This is just a few photographs, but the video will go through all of the techniques defining different techniques that are used because there really isn't much of a source right now for that. And um, so hopefully that'll be out within the year. And uh, one last point that I wanted to make, um, having been a professional climber and um, influenced very highly by the, the 60s generation, uh, I love what you said, Luke, about um, Jack Kerouac and all that stuff. Um, it really did impact my life. Um, and I think we were natural environmentalists back then. Um, we, we thought, leave no trace, you know, leave the rock in its perfect, you know, pristine form. And the world has just gone in the opposite direction with all the things that are going on with fracking. And this is an example of clear cutting, just one of many things. GMO foods, I'm not a fan of any of that. I'm, uh, I'm also not a fan of the way that corporations are um, taking too much of the profit and not giving a fair share to the people. So I'm, I'm hoping that this generation does something about that. Um, you know, first you have to recognize it, then you have to get some organization and people behind it and make the change happen. Because uh, right now the way things look is, you know, the people in power, they've written the laws to keep themselves in power so that they can keep making more money. And they don't need more money, what we need is a beautiful earth that we can all enjoy for our future generations. That's, that's what I'm concluding with that note, and, um, and I really wish you guys do follow your, your dreams and in whatever area that is, your adventures out there. And um, yeah, let's try to make good changes happen in the world. Thank you.